Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning, Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding and a member of DHA, the International Scientific Advisory Board, DISA. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration with DHAD. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mukesh Kapila, Professor of Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, University of Manchester. Dr. Kapila is a Professor of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs, the University of Manchester. He is also Senior Advisor to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. He is a writer, public and media speaker, and has extensive experience in global health, humanitarian affairs, conflict and security, international development, human rights and diplomacy. He has qualifications in medicine, public health and development from universities of Oxford and London. He has served in senior leadership functions at the UK Government Department for International Development, United Nations, World Health Organizations, and International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. He has advised many multilateral institutions, including the World Bank and UN agencies, and international NGOs. He has served on several boards, including Chair of Minority Groups International and of Nonviolent Peace Force, which was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. His other roles have included Founder, CEO of the Defeat NCD Partnership at the United Nations, his many awards include the CBA, CBE from Queen Elizabeth II, the Global Citizenship Award of the Institute for Global Leadership, the Eyewitness Award for Human Rights, and a special resolution of the California State Legislature for Lifetime Achievements and Meritorious Service. His first memoir, Against the Tide of Evil, was shortlisted for the 2013 Best Nonfiction Book award and his further book in 2019 is entitled Not a Stranger to Kindness. The topic for today's webinar is the impact of coronavirus in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Please do so throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to put those questions to Dr. Kapila. And a certificate of attendance will be available at the end of this session. So without further ado, welcome Mukesh. Good to see you. I think you need to just put your your on mute, Dr. Kapila. Okay. There we go. How are you? I'm well, thanks, and glad to connect to all our friends around the world. Thank you, Lukesh. Well, uh, as you know, the, uh, the the title of today's uh, webinar is the impact of coronavirus in Africa, and I think uh, when we we put this together. Uh, we were talking very much about what was happening in Europe. And now if you turn on the news or you look at the, the news on your app every morning, or we can see now that the news is coming out of Africa at quite a rapid rate. Um, if you like, it's a, it's a new storm, I suppose, in some ways. And, and what we talked about uh, a couple of months ago was in Europe, it was a massive challenge, still is a challenge. But that was in an environment where we had information. We had some... Uh, some structures, infrastructures that allowed us to collect data. And indeed, there was uh, the start of the process of a lot of screening in order to collect data. And we talked about that at the time, that when this reaches Africa, we, it's going to be made much more harder by the fact that collecting data, screening, and so on and so forth. So what's your, your take today? Uh, it's a very broad question, the impact on Africa seeing what we're seeing today and the rapid uh, increase of the coronavirus uh, on the continent. I think you mentioned uh, the European experience, and uh, I must say that uh, Africa is uh, lucky in that it can uh, study the experiences of uh, China and Asia on one hand and Europe uh, uh, subsequently to be able to uh, um, work out for itself what the best thing to do in Africa is. And the other thing that has happened in the last uh, six months since WHO declared this to be a public health emergency of international concern is a huge amount has uh, a big, uh, knowledge has become available about the virus, about the disease, what it does to the human body, and uh, what can be done to, uh, to protect people, 
as well as to um, to uh, treat people if you're lucky unlucky enough to get it now if we look at uh, what's going on in africa at, at at the moment i think we are at the very very early stages of the uh, epidemic as it affects africa with a million cases and uh, uh, thousands of deaths 20000 deaths the uh, probably these figures are considerable underestimates for the well stated well known reason that the amount of testing going on uh, in the continent is uh, still quite uh, limited and so i would say we should increase those figures by about five or six fold in terms to get an idea of the total volume of infection that is prevailing on the continent at the present uh, rate however i don't think that the epidemic in africa is going to quite uh, follow the same track as other countries and this is important uh, uh, in our later discussion when we talk about what measures to take in africa uh, and this is because uh, you know the the uh, geography of africa is different it's a very diverse place it's uh, although it is uh, already highly urbanized 40% of africans still live in uh, are living in uh, in cities uh, a large proportion do live in uh, rural areas and the entry points of the virus uh, has been concentrated to uh, to a number of countries and not necessarily all over the continent i think also uh, africa has a younger population uh, the youngest continent uh, on on the planet and undoubtedly that's had some effect in terms of uh, mitigating its uh, its uh, rise, the rise of the virus so far uh, in a way but at the same time the uh, uh, other consequences the, the weak healthcare systems the lack of investment in um, in health services um, uh, hospital capacities and so on and so forth are uh, factors that make uh, africa much more vulnerable than the rest of the world to the worst of this pandemic yet to come thank you mukesh yes different uh, different factors is one of the things that we're going to uh, uh, be uh, be looking at here is communication because i think uh, the, the communication in channels to get out to the uh, um, the areas that are uh, not not in the urban areas getting it out into the villages and so on and so forth communication channels we're seeing i don't want to compare everything to europe but you know it, it's almost been the case that this is what we've been following and watching and even now in europe we're seeing issues with communication in in terms of how people behave um we we talk a lot now about you're responsible you know take ownership of 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 dealing with this so even with good communication channels uh, one language if you like through areas with you know lots of news lots of access to news it's still a problem in africa is the communication channel and we're talking about a continent we when we shouldn't put you know every country into you know one one box here but is communication something that really is going to affect this in africa perhaps more than in europe well it's a mixed blessing isn't it uh, i mean certainly uh, we are bombarded with uh, uh, information uh, where i am in uh, europe at the moment uh, but that's also created its own problems it seems that uh, almost uh, everyone who has who can uh, read and write has set himself or herself up as an oracle on the subject and suddenly the amount the number of experts there are uh, on uh, covid have uh, are almost as much as the population uh, as a whole so uh, i think we have had too much uh, communication and too much information and the diverse sources of information uh, together with misinformation and the lack of trust and so on and attempts by some governments to also control the narrative that comes out in terms of uh, the response of the authorities means that the public is heavily confused now as far as africa is concerned uh, you know africa is also uh, uh, there's a lot of social media around uh, africa there's a lot of word of mouth and uh, i think uh, africa by and large is getting better and better connected to the information superhighway uh, and I, but i think what africans must uh, hopefully learn is to become much more critical about the information that they're getting and actually on the scientific side they should stick to two or three well known channels 
for example, I think you have uh, the African Centers for Disease Control, an excellent uh, um, uh, African initiative that is now really proving its uh, worth. And I think with the World Health Organization and with uh, the African Centers for Disease uh, Control, uh, you probably don't need any other channels to go to, other than, of course, your own Ministry of Health, uh, dependent on which country uh, you are in. But however, the problem is that scientists, especially uh, especially public health specialists and epidemiologists, they tend to be very nuanced and uh, cautious people. While the realities of millions of people on the ground doesn't quite fit into the boxes uh, which, uh, to which the advice can be applied. So the application of knowledge is, I think, where the gap is. What do I do if I'm in a, if I'm living in Kibeho, the biggest uh, slum uh, in Nairobi, uh, and I cannot do social distancing? What do I do if I'm a refugee? What do I do if I'm a, a forced migrant? So the, the application of that information, I think, in practical ways that makes sense to people's daily realities is where the challenge of communication is greatest in Africa. Thank you, Milkesh. Yes, and I think even listening to the radio recently, I'm hearing uh, public uh, messages where people are asking people now to um, look at what they're sharing and think about what they're sharing and, and listen to official government messages in, in Europe. You mentioned uh, uh, access, and uh, one of the things I, I, I read was that I think 20% of people in Africa have access to what we call reliable soap. Um, or uh, no access, I should say, to reliable soap. This is a challenge, isn't it? Because when you're talking about certain communities that have to prioritise, um, you know, uh, water, food, then we look at maybe soap, then we maybe look at toothpaste, things that we take for granted that we know are really important when it comes to prevention and looking after ourselves. This is a particular challenge, isn't it, in certain parts of Africa when you, you have to prioritise in, in a different way. So. You know, getting people to um, adhere to what's going on right now is, is a specific challenge, I think. Well, what uh, the virus has shown us are fundamental vulnerabilities. And by the way, this is true uh, in the more uh, so-called developed countries also, as much as it is in Africa. Uh, let me start off there. For example, um, the other day, the French uh, president was uh, speaking uh, and uh, uh, he said that he was shocked that he didn't realize that France did not manufacture its paracetamol anymore. So what, what we're finding is that in the kind of sophisticated development track that most countries have been embarking on and making uh, progress, including in Africa, of course, uh, very much in Africa, uh, if you don't get the fundamentals right, then I think that progress is just based uh, on quicksand. So in the case of, uh, of uh, COVID, we know that uh, the most important thing you can do is uh, wash your hands with uh, soap and water. Thank God the virus is susceptible to soap, the most, uh, most basic of all uh, cleansing agents. So when I was doing some research into this, I was really quite shocked uh, to do some calculations which showed that maybe only about 20% of Africans had regular access to, to soap. And in terms of access to water, uh, you know, that is uh, quite uh, limited as well in many countries uh, in Africa. Uh, and so if you combine the two together, you realize that the simple health giving prescription or life saving prescription or washing your hands frequently uh, is just not possible in many situations. Well, let me give you another example of what I call uh, the, the fundamentals, basic fundamentals of development. We know for in the early part of this uh, pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, anxiety about the number of ventilators and uh, whether or not uh, hospitals around the world. And suddenly in Europe, everyone is rushing around constructing ventilators. Car companies were re-engineering uh, their plants to produce ventilators instead of uh, uh, cars. Uh, this is because of the number of people who were expected to come into hospital and rely on ventilators, and they were getting very sick and so on and so forth. Africa has, uh, I think, uh, only about one um, uh, ITU intensive care bed with a ventilator per, uh, uh, per 100,000 population, and probably it should have five or six, now, if not more. However, as we went along, we learned that actually if, uh, to get into a, uh, onto a ventilator is really almost bad news 
because only about one or two people who get put on ventilators come out alive. And after you've been ventilated, uh, you are going to take many months to recover because of the uh, secondary impacts of uh, mechanical ventilation. So the interest became uh, much greater on the use of ordinary oxygen to keep people uh, as well as possible when you go into hospital. And surveys recently have shown that in Africa, very few hospitals and health centers have access to a reliable supply of oxygen. Oxygen is a very basic item and the oxygen manufacturing plants are few and far between around Africa and even oxygen concentrators, which is a low technology device to concentrate oxygen from the air, could do a lot to actually stop people getting so sick that they have to go into intensive care and need, uh, need ventilators. So along with the uh, basics like soap, I would put, for example, oxygen. Now you need oxygen for other things also, like, uh, like uh, childbirth, like ordinary surgery and such like. It's only when uh, this uh, virus started impacting, we realized that I don't know what uh, we've been doing in the last 20, 30 years. That the very fundamentals of these basic items seem uh, to have been ignored or seem to be in such short, short supply while we're short uh, ahead in so many other areas. This has implications. I think this has implications for, uh, for uh, policymakers, and this has implications, in a sense, for re-engineering the whole of healthcare. I don't think, I think that the, the tendency in developing countries is uh, to copy the so-called developed countries. So for example, the lockdowns that happened around Africa, uh, including in some African countries, they had a lockdown before they even had the first uh, case uh, of, of the virus because they were simply copying what happened in Wuhan or they were copying what happened in Italy. Um, and, uh, and now, as we know, with uh, the uh, expanding cases, the lockdowns in Africa were probably premature. There is no point in locking down a country when there isn't a single virus in the country. Now, at that stage, something else should have been done. But because there was this fear of the virus, also spread by explosive information coming out from other uh, countries, and without adapting to the local local context, it takes us down, I think, uh, 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 down a road. It has taken us down a road where probably the economic and social impacts of the virus are going to be much greater than the health impacts of the virus. And we're already beginning to see that in, uh, in uh, countries in Africa, say, for example, in uh, South Africa. Thank you, Mukesh. Would you say, and this is from one of our, our participants, are you seeing um, the COVID-19 being addressed in a similar manner in all African countries? Or, or are you seeing differences? Uh, uh, you know, I, we, I hate to generalize about Africa. You know, it's obviously many, many countries. But uh, are you seeing differences across some of the countries and how they're behaving towards this? Uh, uh, thankfully, we are seeing differences. I, I mean, uh, uh, difference for the sake of uh, difference is not good, but similarity for the sake of similarity is even 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 worse. Now, in the diversity of Africa, uh, some countries are more gateway countries, which are better, which are more connected to the outside world, where the virus was first introduced, for example, Egypt and uh, and uh, uh, South Africa. Others are uh, 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 more urbanized. Uh, um, the domestic uh, domestic uh, networks of uh, transport and communications uh, or transport are very different in countries so therefore it's very very important that national responses are domesticated that each country should be able to devise its own strategy and the balance of restrictions to be imposed on society at a moment of time dependent on the epidemiology having said that there are certain things that all countries uh, are starting to do beginning of the of the uh, of the epidemic in africa uh, very few countries could uh, could test for the covid virus right now every country can do that and that's amazing uh, progress thanks to the uh, help of uh, the world health organization mostly in this in this particular area we're also seeing uh, thanks uh, a lot for the work for example of uh, national red cross and red crescent uh, societies of the international federation of red cross and red crescent uh, where ev there are community messaging or adapted to local circumstances, but in different ways in virtually every country in Africa now. So what you see there is uh, both the strength of diversity, as well as what we know are common strategies of public health that should be applied uh, wherever the case might be. Now, 
However, capacities are different. So some countries are more capable, if you like, of applying public health strategies uh, and uh, other countries are not. So even if other countries are willing to do it, they may not have the capability to do it. And that's where I think the current challenges, uh, challenges uh, lie on how we should do this. So in that regard, it's extremely important that more and more the responses are more and more localized. We cannot apply continental-wide approaches. We cannot even apply national approaches. It has to be done rural, urban, uh, uh, and uh, uh, remote communities and uh, people who live in concentrated situations. And that, I think, requires almost everyday fine-tuning as we go along. And above all else, I think capacity to test, trace, isolate is going to remain critical for a long time to come everywhere. Thank you, Mukesh. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that some of the countries were moving into lockdown before, you know, because they were uh, copying, if you like, what was going on in Europe. So you've mentioned a few things about localizing and, and testing. Testing, of course, uh, costs money. Um, but if you were to, you know, two months ago, you had a crystal ball and you were to be able to sit down with all the, the, the health ministers in Africa, so on and so forth, we know they're not all going to uh, react in the same way. Knowing what we know now, do you think there would have been a really strong uh, possibility to uh, do something in Africa in, in advance of where we are now? Well, um, no, if, uh, I think the importance of uh, testing and contact tracing is uh, as old as, uh, you know, the first uh, virus or bacteria were isolated. You know, people were testing, uh, well, not testing in those days, we didn't have laboratories and so on. But uh, for example, when plague spread in the 17th, 16th, 15th uh, centuries, the the idea of identifying a, a case, in that case through clinical means as opposed to lab testing and isolating them, what is a fundamental part of public health science. And when COVID came along, it was actually reminding people that the fundamentals of public health approaches to controlling epidemics is exactly the same. Now, luckily, Ebola had uh, Ebola in West Africa, and then the repeated epidemics in the in Congo, in, in the in DRC, have actually given a lot of experience to the African uh, continent, and not just uh, and not just the Ebola. After all, uh, HIV and AIDS, which devastated the continent uh, at a time that I was working in development and uh, and was based actually in Southern Africa as part of the British government uh, uh, development uh, ministry at that, at that time. So in that sense, these are very, very familiar approaches where I think all countries were uh, uh, kind of uh, taken aback is uh, that because this is a novel virus, there wasn't a, a test for it, a reliable test for it. And then the test that is available uh, uh, is very, very cumbersome. And thirdly, the supply of the testing material, you know, the chemicals and others they use is very, very, very limited. And this is because the scientific infrastructure on which is the basis on which to produce antigens and antibodies based uh, tests just was either too concentrated in a few countries or it was uh, 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 not even available. Now in Africa, this is one of the biggest problems. I think Africa, a continent of 1.2 billion uh, people and growing, has to develop a scientific capability for being able to do these things within the con within the continent. This doesn't mean that you know every country should set up its own factories to produce its own uh, uh, tests or its produce its own vaccine. That doesn't make sense uh, at all. Uh, but of course, you have an African Union, and uh, I think Africa can uh, can uh, and African collaboration extends in many other areas very successfully uh, as well. So if we if we were to go back, I. I'm afraid to say that the worldwide shortage of uh, reagents and tests and even figuring out what was the right test to do and uh, what it showed and could you could you uh, could you could you uh, trust the tests that were initially put out by the manufacturers uh, was such that uh, I doubt whether we could have done uh, more than that I mean the, the, the you know there's uh, what is worse than testing is uh, uh, having uh, tests that give you false positives and false negatives, as well as uh, not having a system of uh, contact tracing and separation. There's no point in testing uh, 
if there isn't the whole infrastructure that goes with it to do something with a positive test or a negative test. Sure, thank you, Milkesh. Uh, paraphrasing one of the uh, uh, one of the audience's questions here, economics comes into this, and you know, testing we know is now um, freely available in many countries. But you know, we have uh, huge populations living in in uh, deprived areas. Um, you know, affording the test or even uh, health organisations being able to afford the testing equipment in Africa. Uh, we, we're not going to get the same uh, access to these uh, testing kits uh, and, and to be able to disperse them amongst the population and collect those statistics in the same way that's perhaps being done in other countries. This is a real challenge, right? It is. Uh, I think it's a challenge uh, uh, when there is a shortage of the essentials that you need, whether it is uh, test kits, or whether it is personal protective equipment for healthcare workers, uh, whether it's masks uh, and so on. But again, this is nothing new in the healthcare system. Shortages are there all the time in every, I mean, every citizen knows about this. And by the way, this is true also in the West. That's why there are guidelines. That's why uh, WHO and the African Center for Disease Control, they have uh, put out uh, very clear guidance on who to test, when to test, and the priorities for the testing. Sure, if you can't uh, test uh, everyone, then one has to prioritize who is to be tested. And these are essentially healthcare workers and who, who are at the front line of care, as well as the, the most uh, uh, vulnerable groups, as well as uh, those with symptoms suggestive of COVID, and uh, where a test would be helpful in making the clinical diagnosis because it might affect the treatment that the person might be given. And most of all, uh, if uh, isolation or quarantining is going to be needed for the individual uh, who has uh, who's got COVID-like symptoms, and we need to know whether or not the person has has got the virus or not. So I think uh, the uh, uh, guidance on pri uh, prioritization has become very, very clear. And it's extremely important that every country develops its testing approach according to those priorities. Because otherwise, if you have random testing going on here and there, according to who can afford it, according to when the supply comes in, according to which organization, NGO or uh, international organization or local ministry of health is uh, capable, then we will have just complete uh, uh, kind of a patchwork of testing, which is not going to advance us very far. And with the testing, I think uh, going back to what you, what you were saying at the very beginning, the importance of data management comes in. Uh, the testing is useful at the individual level, uh, but even more importantly, it's useful at the public health level to be able to trace uh, what's happening to this uh, virus uh, in, and which direction it is going. Thank you, Mukesh. You mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the example in France in relation to maybe finding out uh, what's going on with their own um, uh, medicines and drugs. Is, is it a concern that some of the countries that would traditionally go to Africa and support and help like it, the Ebola, you know, uh, many years ago. Is it a concern now that a lot of countries are actually looking within the, their own borders? Is that something that should concern uh, Africa when it comes to getting support in this regard? I think uh, the issue of uh, availability, access and affordability of essential diagnostics, medicines and vaccines when they're available is the topmost concern at the moment. Uh, um, there are a number of international uh, efforts going on, uh, WHO, uh, the uh, Vaccine uh, Alliance, uh, Gavi, uh, have got mechanisms under design to ensure that uh, when effective drugs are available uh, and when vaccines are available, there is some systematic basis of making them available to countries based on need rather than how, how rich the, the country is. But let's be realistic about this. Uh, I'm afraid uh, from a domestic political perspective, the first responsibility of government is to look after its own population. And uh, one, of the, one of the realities that we have learned from uh, this uh, pandemic so far is that when a pandemic of this nature strikes, it's virtually every country for itself. And even more so, if you're going to close down boundaries, 
if you're going to stop the uh, transport and movement of uh, essential supplies and drugs, if you're going to put the export orders on essential drugs, which has happened in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, for example, even within the European Union, it has happened. So I'm afraid that vaccine nationalism, which is what uh, people are worrying about now uh, for when the vaccine, when we have an effective vaccine or vaccines, uh, is going to be a reality. Uh, there isn't an easy answer to this, other than that, uh, that every country uh, needs, uh, in the end, to be responsible for its own health security. But we need global cooperation, uh, and because not every country will be able to be self-reliant. And clearly, it would be hugely wasteful of resources. It's every small country uh, without an industrial base had to become as self-reliant as the most advanced industrial economies. Clearly, that doesn't make uh, sense either. But unless we have a, a rules-based uh, formula for international cooperation, uh, then uh, it is certainly going to be a problem. And yes, I worry about the poorest countries in Africa. I worry about the, uh, the uh, politically less strong countries in Africa who are going to be at the bottom of the queue in this regard. Uh, World Health Organization and others are going to do their uh, damnedest to ensure equity and uh, there are plenty of activists around as well in the public health uh, space to ensure uh, um, uh, greater access availability on uh, fairness. But the direction of travel uh, at the moment is not good. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, countries like the UK, the US, uh, uh, France and others signing up mega billion uh, dollars worth of uh, contracts with uh, companies for vaccines which have not even yet been known to work. So you can imagine what is going to be down the, down the line. Yeah, let's maybe let's talk a little bit about vaccine. Um, one of our audience was asked whether or not you think there's a chance of a vaccine being available at, at the end of the year. I, I, I'm not sure if you're privy to that kind of information, but there's a lot of talk about vaccines in the news and, and um, you know, different directions, different countries doing and so forth. But my question is more related to when there's a vaccine. And we don't know, let's say for it's, it's manufactured, for example, in uh, Luxembourg, well, it could be wherever. Transportation and storage is, is something that's going to play a major part in this. So even if they can uh, produce vaccines enough that can be uh, delivered equitably across the world is, is a stretch. But when, when let's talk about Africa again specifically, we have a vaccine, Transportation of that vaccine is going to have, need um, very specific uh, logistics in terms of temperature control. When it arrives, it's going to have to be stored in very specific uh, uh, environments, again, with temperature control. Now, I'm sure some of these e exist a little bit in, in Africa. What could we do today, looking forward and say, if there's a vaccine available in you know, X number of months or one year, for example, what can Africa do today as a collective to ensure that A, the, the logistics and the shipping is ready, uh, it can be transported effectively and safely, and when it arrives, it can be stored uh, effectively and safely. Is there something that we can preempt now that, they, that can be done now today until, and so we don't get to that stage and find out that it's another issue on top of a difficult issue? Yeah. Firstly, to say that, uh, um, Everyone is hoping for a vaccine soon, but uh, you know, relying on hope is not a strategy. Uh, however, I think uh, what the way people are working on vaccines now, using the latest of science and technologies and modeling, including computer modeling on the shape of the virus and, and using techniques which were not in existence uh, even uh, 10 years ago, means, and the number of groups working on around the world uh, on it and taking different routes uh, to try to get to an effective vaccine, uh, you know, is, is very encouraging. And some of the vaccines are now in uh, uh, phase three trials, which means they're being tried out, at early stages of trying out whether or not they actually work in human beings. Having said that, the biggest challenge is going to be not transportation or logistics, uh, as you say, because you know, there are uh, experienced uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, chains already in existence for other things, polio, measles, uh, and all the standard conditions. I mean, of course, if the vaccine is very unstable and it needs uh, 
I don't know, some kind of uh, to be stored in hugely low temperatures, that may create a difficulty. But I don't think that's necessarily going to, that's going to be the ca case. So I don't think transport logistics is going to be a problem. And I think with the small doses required, you could probably uh, carry enough in a thermos flask for 10,000 people, uh, you know, in your, ha in your hand uh, luggage. Uh, what is going to be much more of a, of a challenge is uh, going to be to actually get it to the to to people who need it first and ensuring that uh, it's uh, available uh, in uh, in real time across the continent for example why is that important uh, say let us say that a, rich, a richer country like south africa can afford the vaccine more than say a, a war torn country like uh, like somalia uh, so the the tension will be that the richer countries on the continent might want to, uh, you know, corner whatever vaccine they can get get hold of, and the weaker countries or conflict-torn countries or poorer countries will not be able to get to it. But no one is going to be safe uh, uh, unless everyone is safe, and therefore it's going to require a great deal of collaboration and cooperation uh, to be able to ensure fair access to it. Now, in my view, this is best done. From, uh, from an African institution. Of course, the WHO globally can uh, do a lot and Gavi as a global organization can do that. And uh, they are uh, both, uh, they both got African kind of branches. Uh, I think WHO has a very competent regional office for Africa, for example. But I think the growth of uh, intra-African cooperation is going to be extremely important in this particular area. And having said this also, uh, it would be wise to pour a little bit of cold water on uh, on relying on vaccines, uh, you know, I would be very surprised if a vaccine is available before the middle of the year. Uh, happy to be uh, to be very surprised and pleased uh, for it. And even if the vaccine is available tomorrow, and even if we are able to uh, ensure uh, access and availability, uh, I think the the you you are going to have to need something like 70, 80 percent population coverage to actually come to the. Uh, level of population immunity. I mean, at the moment, uh, maybe less than 10% of the African population has had exposure to the virus. I mean, these figures are not, uh, un, uh, are not uh, you know, accurate figures. But uh, despite the fact we had six months of the virus, uh, even in Europe, we've had a very small numbers of uh, people actually uh, immune to it. So what that means is that we're going to have a real uh, issue but getting enough coverage, enough uh, up to ensure population immunity. So vaccines are part of the uh, solution, uh, hopefully, but to be honest, it is going to be, I would say not necessarily the most important part of the solution, at least for the period ahead. For the next two, three years ahead, we're going to have to rely on the old fashioned public health techniques we talked about, physical distancing, hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably true. And uh, from my understanding, and historically, the production of vaccines or successful vaccines, I, I'm not sure in one year, um, uh, you would know better than me. Well, uh, is, historically, it's ever really uh, uh, been done. There is, uh, I think, uh, uh, there, there is, there's some interesting other challenges. For example, uh, the intellectual property of the, uh, of the vaccine. Um, apart from the fact that uh, uh, rich countries want to corner the market in that, the question is, will the companies that succeed in making the vaccines, except effective vaccines, allow it to be licensed to others? And now, if you were to rely only on one manufacturer, the original discoverer of the vaccine, and wait for that company to make enough vaccine to cover the whole world, we'll be waiting for, for years to come, okay? So there are two ways to this. One is that the vaccine, uh, the intellectual property of the vaccine is shared, perhaps in return for a fee uh, to, to manufacturers around the world. And uh, there's good progress in that. There are, there are for example, vaccine manufacturers in India uh, already waiting to uh, uh, make the vaccine that, is being, uh, that has been uh, uh, discovered and has been spent on in Oxford. So that the more and more uh, different manufacturers will be able to make the same vaccine uh, under license and and uh, preferably as close as possible to the populations under their jurisdiction. I very much hope. Uh, I don't know much about this area in uh, as far as Africa is concerned, 
But I very much hope that African leaders um, and the public health function of the African Union is looking at the possibility of vaccine manufacture within Africa using uh, uh, under license from other countries. The same applies, by the way, to treatment, because there are already a couple of drugs which reduce the intensity of, uh, of uh, the seriousness of the, of the condition, and they may be more discovered uh, in time. The, uh, by actually using the, the World Trade Organization provision for what's called the, the TRIPS uh, exception, we did this, I mean, South Africa and uh, others, uh, other countries, uh, when HIV came along and the antiretrovirals were not available, uh, you know, they were allowed to be manufactured in, in countries under a special provision of the World Trade Organization on intellectual property rights. I think similar sort of provision is going to be needed uh, for this area. But this is where the tension really lies. The, uh, the, remember that the world's biggest pharmaceutical manufacturers and vaccine manufacturers are based in uh, Europe or uh, North America. And the governments of those countries are not wanting developing countries in Africa or elsewhere to be using the provisions uh, of uh, uh, the TRIPS, the, uh, the exception allowed for uh, when there is a national emergency and a national crisis to override uh, intellectual property rights and, uh, and be able to manufacture things. So, uh, because if you do that, then uh, I think uh, uh, the feeling is that uh, companies will uh, not uh, want to invest in, uh, in production of these things. However, there is another side. This is why it's such a complicated area. I mean, let us look at the experience uh, going on in, uh, in Oxford or in China for that particular, particular matter. It may be that private sector companies are going to make drugs or vaccines. However, the people, the, the, in, the scientists, the uh, doctors, the uh, laboratory workers, have by and large, almost everywhere in the world, been produced by publicly funded universities, if you like, you see. So like Oxford, where, uh, you know, um, I, 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 I remember training there. Now, so the idea that private sector manufacturers can benefit, if you like, without due compensation to the public sector, which has actually produced the, the, the people who have done the research that led to the production in the first place. And this is a highly, I think, a debatable subject. This is why, the, obviously, public-private partnerships are important, but the rules under which public-private partnership uh, uh, are done and sustained are, I think, uh, uh, very much open to debate, discussion, and argument. And this is where we're at now in terms of uh, arguments that are going on in the world stage. Thank you, Mukesh. Yeah, very, very interesting uh, look at how that will that will work out. Uh, change tax slightly. Uh, one of our audience has talked about uh, South Africa, which you only have to turn on the news and South Africa's in the news. And their question is, uh, why does South Africa seem to be um, so stricken uh, compared to some of the other uh, African countries right now? Why do we think we've seen this, uh, this surge in South Africa compared to some of the other countries? Would you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, uh, the uh, process of virus transmission is the same everywhere. This is a highly contagious virus. And uh, while it kills very few people, uh, and uh, uh, the vast majority of people will get it without even, and many of them will get it without even knowing it, and uh, uh, a few are going to die. And uh, the more who get it, obviously, the more in absolute numbers will die. So the actual proportion of those who die remains quite, quite low. Uh, worldwide, it's maybe 3 4%. Uh, and in some countries in Africa, it's, uh, it's, in most countries in Africa, it's less than 1% um, based on the tests that, that, that have been done. So probably what's happened in South Africa is, uh, 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 is what we've seen in Italy, we've seen in the United States, you've seen in, uh, in uh, the UK, and that is that uh, uh, when the virus got in introduced in a particular community or a setting, it spread without detection. And by the time it got detected, it had spread very widely. 
So in the, in the case of South Africa, it is an economic hub for Southern Africa and indeed the, an economic hub for Africa as a whole. It is well connected both uh, regionally, uh, continentally and internationally. Uh, I have to be careful what I say here because this seems to imply that uh, if only we close uh, boundaries and uh, stop all contact with the outside world, we'll be safe. But uh, as we also know, closing down borders and uh, shutting off travel, that has happened uh, now uh, in Africa as well, uh, hasn't actually stopped the spread of the uh, epidemic. So we have to be careful how we, how we judge this uh, in, in a way. I've, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, but people have been moving and traveling around, uh, crowds gathering, shops, um, uh, you know, there's a lively industrial sector in, uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa. They also have their uh, homes for the nursing homes, care for the elderly and all those kinds of things, all those kinds of places. So there's, there's nothing particularly mysterious about uh, the spread in uh, South Africa. It just reflects the fact that developed economies, and South Africa is more developed than other uh, regions in, uh, in Africa, but we could also talk about Kenya in this context uh, as well, is obviously they're more prone to it. I mean, look at what happened in Wuhan, a highly industrialized uh, city. Uh, and it went, it spread everywhere because of the intensity of the population and the intensity of the interactions that were taking place before the virus was uh, detected, as in New York, as in London. So I, I, I don't think w w w uh, what happened in South Africa, uh, there are lessons to be learned about this, but I do not think there are some extraordinary factors at play, other than, other than the fact that, the, that uh, uh, you know, the lack of physical distancing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is what actually led to the epidemic expanding. And we are going to see this probably in some other places uh, as well. Uh, but demographic composition comes in, in, into play. Uh, I'm not uh, sure how whether the population of South Africa is older than the population of the rest of Africa, but I imagine I think uh, it is. Uh, and in some areas, at least in Johannesburg, in Gotham province, for example. So that probably had a role to play in it as well. Thank you, Mukesh. I think, yeah, it proves one thing that some of the same debates that we were having about Europe two months ago, why here, why not there, why this area, why not that area, why these people, not those people, it's exactly the same. You know, we're starting to see the same conversations and debates in, in parts of Africa and uh, uh, the different factors, but certainly still unanswered questions. And I think when we look back on this, uh, sometime people will have a better understanding of uh, how it how it spread how it manifested itself. Mm. However, it's very very important that Africa today learns the lessons of what is happening in the parts of the world today, not learn the lessons of what happened at the beginning of the pandemic. So, if you look around Europe now, or in for that matter in uh, Southeast Asia, we are having spikes of the virus. So, despite lockdowns and some countries were more or less rigorous in doing that but many many countries did impose very serious uh, lockdowns uh, uh, certainly i can testify that from my own experience of being locked down for three four months um, and yet we are now seeing uh, secondary uh, spikes so does that mean uh, so the lesson to learn is that this virus is here to stay that measures which don't go with the grain of the livelihood of the people are unlikely to make a difference in the long run. My bet is that if you were having this conversation three, four, five years from now, we will find that the mortality rate from, uh, from the virus around the world is probably uh, overall in aggregate going to be uh, comparable regardless of who acted first, who locked down first, and who came off it first. Now, this is highly contentious, and I'm sure many friends and colleagues of mine in the field will, uh, will, will immediately beat, beat me down. But I think this story is not fully, uh, fully over yet, and we can't run to make, uh, make judgments. And meanwhile, let's not forget the secondary impact. I think every year in, in Africa, something like uh, 700,000 people die of AIDS still. Uh, something like uh, the same number, 600,000 or thereabouts, uh, die of malaria. Remember, we have got effective treatments for those, uh, for those conditions, no vaccines, 
for AIDS or malaria, but we have extremely effective treatments for both HIV infections and for, for malaria. And 700,000 people are still dying of these conditions. Remember also that uh, the rate of uh, diabetes in Africa is rising very, very fast. Maybe 10 to 20% of the population has got diabetes, especially in urban areas. And the rate of hypertension is extremely high. In maybe 20, 30% uh, on a recent visit to Kenya, I was literally shocked as to what was going on uh, in Nairobi in terms of the amount of cardiovascular disease that there was uh, around. And we know that these non-communicable diseases are an important risk factor for whether or not you're going to survive uh, 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 COVID. Now, the estimates of the number of people who are going to die of, uh, of uh, COVID, and these are all modeling estimates, etc. cetera. Uh, WHO's uh, recent estimate on a kind of mid-level uh, approach is maybe 190 million, let's uh, so 190, uh, sorry, 190,000, uh, 200,000. Now, when the 700,000 people are dying of malaria uh, each year, and you may have an additional 200,000 uh, dying of uh, COVID, it puts things into perspective. Uh, not to misunderstand me, I'm not saying therefore COVID is less important or, uh, or saying that, uh, okay, what's all this fuss about, et cetera, et cetera, because you also have comorbidities, people who have TB, people who have AIDS, they are, uh, and then they, if they get uh, COVID, uh, then clearly they are, uh, they're going to be worse off, if you like. But there are estimates, for example, that because of the closure of health services and health systems and the shutting down of the economies and the shrinking of the fiscal space of countries uh, in Africa, uh, maybe a 20% reduction of, uh, of budgets of health uh, in, in the health sector, we will have something like 10 to 20% increase in deaths from HIV and AIDS alone. Uh, let alone other conditions that I mentioned, and there are other conditions I've not mentioned. For example, access to reproductive health care, maternity care, and, and so on. So when you put those things into perspective, you realize that the very last thing that Africa should do, that African leaders should do, that African people should do, is one, either copy the West or copy China. Secondly, to panic on this. Thirdly, to uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to get uh, this out of proportion or balance. So my advice to the African uh, continent and Africans is, uh, please uh, practice your uh, individual precautions. Do your very best in the circumstances you are in, wearing masks, uh, hand washing, etc. Let soap alone would do more for Africa than uh, the provision of soap to everyone as a basic human right, uh, if you like, would probably do more for Africa than the provision of vaccines. Of a COVID vaccine. Now, when you get down to that kind of level, it's obvious what needs to happen. And you know, open up the borders, let people go to go to work, provided they can work safely. And places where you can't work safely, you have to learn to live with risk. After all, we've been living with risk in uh, around the world on many many conditions for a very long period of time. The future of Africa is not based on, or is cannot be based on uh, closing down the continent. Uh, forever until there is a cure or until there is a, a, a vaccine because that's not going to happen and we know there are many many other conditions for which we have cures and even vaccines and yet they're highly debilitating and prevalent there so uh, what worries me about uh, uh, about africa is that uh, it's a continent that is shrinking shrinking in its economy shrinking in its uh, in its uh, vision uh, shrinking and uh, and uh, Seven years of development of the last uh, seven years has been uh, wiped out in the in the first six months of this year in Africa, if you like to see. And more people may die of poverty and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the secondary consequences of a shrunken economy than actually might die with the virus. So, uh, again, not to misinterpret me, this is uh, not me saying uh, ignore the virus and go back and do whatever you like and uh, don't worry if people, people die. But it's very, very important that public health policymaking is based on a balance of risks and ensuring that uh, other conditions and the society can function. That's a real challenge for both uh, public health uh, uh, people uh, as well as uh, as well as uh, leaders, particularly uh, particularly uh, you know finance and economics. You know, Africa is spending more on debt repayment each year than it has spent on COVID uh, prevention and, uh, and management this year, okay? So there, uh, immediately there is a solution. 
in the sense of, uh, sense of actually giving Africa a debt holiday. And by that, I mean not postponing the debt. I mean, it's okay, $700 million uh, uh, of uh, debt repayment this year can be delayed till next year, the year after, but eventually it'll have to be paid. So, so burdening future generation with debt for surviving today is not the answer either, because here we will have an intergener intergenerational inequalities, which are growing already on top of the inequality we have, we have at the moment. So I think it's those considerations are going to be much more important in the battle against uh, uh, the coronavirus than purely the medical and public health uh, uh, thinking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, important and central as those, uh, those things are. Thank you, Mukesh. Yeah, I think uh, the relationship with uh, the economy is, is something that we're, we're seeing uh, connected to this, uh, not just, uh, you know, outside of Africa as well, and Africa's no exception. And as you said, what's going on now, it can uh, severely affect uh, uh, the, the economy. And uh, some of our audience have talked about the effect on macroeconomics, and that's, that's the thing that could exasperate exasperate the situation, you know, on top of what already is a, a public health issue. Uh, okay, we have just a few minutes left. Um, so I would like to ask you one question uh, in relation to the 17th edition of DHA, which is uh, aid after coronavirus, uh, a focus on Africa. Um, I'm sure uh, you would like to give your comments on that theme for next year. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the next edition of uh, uh, DHAD uh, on uh, uh, aid in Africa in the COVID age or post-COVID age could not be more timely. I think what I hope we will be able to discuss in next year's uh, DHAD is uh, not about how to resume business or how to resume uh, what we were doing before, but how we might take this opportunity provided by this virus. Uh, and I say this not in any, any callous sense, but simply saying that the crisis really forces us to think of a transformational approach. So whether it is in humanitarian work dealing with, uh, with the 29 million um, uh, refugees and internally displaced that are in Africa, or whether it is with uh, reinvesting in health systems, or whether it is uh, visiting uh, uh, institutional capacities and governance across uh, Africa. Simply resuming the previous trajectory it would be a hugely missed opportunity. So what I'm looking forward in the nation of Dihar is not about resuming business, but about completely finding a different way of doing business. It may well be it would fundamentally reshape our institutions, whether they are the institutions of government, whether they are about uh, the way civil society works, or whether it is about the, the provision of social care or, and health care or uh, education. And what that new paradigm might be is I think uh, going to be uh, quite an exciting discussion uh, next year. And I would encourage everyone to, uh, to tune into that when the time comes. Thank you, Mukesh. Uh, yes, DHAD next year, 15th to the 17th of March. We, we urge all our participants to engage with uh, that event, and you can find everything from the, the DHAD website. So, Mukesh, I think um, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, it's impossible to discuss such a huge issue in one hour, but I want to thank you for giving us uh, so many insights into what's going on. It's uh, ever evolving situation. It's a new situation in so many ways, but your thoughts have been uh, most appreciated. We've had lots of questions um, from our participants. As always, I apologize for not being able to ask all of them. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone at DHAD, uh, the members of DSAB, and of course, uh, Index Holding uh, for uh, working on this uh, webinar. Makesh, I'll give the last word to you. Um, I want to thank all our participants uh, for joining us this evening. And uh, Mukesh, uh, thank you so much once again, and I hope we get to do it again soon. 
Um, I wish you a wonderful evening, but I'll give the last word to you before we say uh, good evening to all our, our participants. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone who's joined us from around, around the world. You know, I think let me just reiterate uh, one point, and that is what this virus has illustrated are the fundamental vulnerabilities of society, and it's true everywhere in the world. Now, my message to people in, uh, concerned with Africa, and, and I consider myself uh, one of them, is that actually Africa is stronger than it thinks it is. And I think Africa is more resilient than it thinks it is. And I think also we need, and Africans need to work on African solutions. You know, they all saying African solutions for African uh, uh, problems. Well, this isn't an African problem, it's a global problem. But the problem with the world pandemic is that it, it uh, somehow disempowers the individual. Oh my God, this has affected the whole world. I can't do everything. Doesn't matter how big the problem gets. Doesn't matter how many millions, tens of millions are affected. And sadly, uh, some millions may even, even, even die. Doesn't matter. In the end, however big the problem is, the solution is a local one. And that I think, and it is a sum total of those local solutions that come together as national solutions and then become inter, uh, uh, continental solutions. And that would be my main message to, to everyone. It is not about looking at it from the top down, but looking at it from and acting from the bottom up and dealing with the fundamentals as opposed to the superstructure that uh, everyone uh, perhaps uh, in the name of development uh, often uh, uh, focuses on. Thank you. Thank you, Mikesh. It's been a pleasure. I wish you a good evening. And once again, to all our participants, uh, hope to see you again and speak to you again soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mikesh. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.